What is up, everybody? Thanks for joining me back again on Capsule to Cone. If this is your second or third video that you've seen on the channel, welcome, welcome. We've had a lot of new subscribers recently, and that is because we are running a giveaway for this compressor right here. This is a Clark Technic 76KT, and we did a shootout against one of our Purple Audio MC77s. We called it Attack of the Clones. You can go and see that video. It will be linked, whatever. One of these little bubbles will fly over like all the cool fancy YouTubers do. Um, or you can also go down in the description box and there'll be a link to that video. We also have a giveaway that we are running. Linky thing down there too. You can enter to win the 76 KT. So watch the demo. Listen to how it sounds, see how it compares to the purple MC-77, and then go and try to win it. So that is the first thing that I want to say. Second, this video is going to be a continuation of a series that we started back in the fall with Nate Washburn. And things happen as they often do when you're busy running a studio and doing some of the other things that I'm doing. Also, this whole coronavirus thing is happening, and I did manage to get out of the house for a few hours today and come to be in the studio, and it feels so good, even though there's no one here except for me. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick up with this series that we started back in the fall with my pal, Nate Washburn. Nate is a fantastic producer. He's played in tons of bands. He's made tons of records. He is a master of getting big, beefy rock guitar sounds. And so this is Nate's five steps for getting great sounding guitars on a rock record. And so the, the video, we shot it as mostly a conversation between Nate and I, but I am going to sit here in the studio and give you the steps in order and then cut to me and Nate. So here, number one is determine the sound that you're going for and then make a plan for the gear that you need to be able to record or capture that sound. So this one's sort of simple and more of a pre-production idea, but you know, I, I spoke a little bit earlier about how it's super important to listen to the band's material, like whatever they kind of provide you. Okay. And have in your head what you think the band, your, your, the, the record that you guys produce, what is it going to sound like? What are you aiming for? So you're talking about amps, cabs, pedals, guitars, right. whatever. This is specific to the guitar sound. I mean, obviously, like the overall sound of the record is sort of implied by what, you know, guitars and amps and pedals you choose. Yeah. Um, specifically for rock music, because that's so much of the character, you know. It's less important for other styles, but for rock, it's like the guitar sound is like paramount. Sure. So having some idea that you're listening to the band like oh this band kind of has this really cool like you know big fat martial sound you know even yeah. before you step into the studio you may think that okay um or you might think like oh the guitar is actually like really non-traditional maybe it doesn't maybe it sounds like you know a roland jc120 or something you know or, or maybe that's what you're envisioning the record you're going to make with them sounds like. Okay. So it doesn't have to be what the band currently sounds like, but it might be what they're referencing or what they, you know, what they really want. So, so they're, they're... So what did you choose for this particular song that we're, that, that you wrote for, for, for... Right. So for, for, for this, this video. yeah, for this song, uh, I, I sort of had it the guitar sound in my head from the beginning okay. and knew like, I probably want to do like a really classic overdriven JCM uh, 800. Okay. And double that with another kind of full bore rock and roll amp. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know. It could have been the Marshall JMP uh, and in this song, it ended up being the, the Orange Thunderbird. So, you know, the Thunderverb and the 800 honestly sound really similar, but I kind of went into the writing of this song knowing I wanted a really tight, focused, modern rock, Yeah. you know, like distorted sound. So your method is to use the same guitar, but use different amps, or is that not necessarily a rule? That's just what happened on this song. I Yeah, I, I would, I kind of avoid <laughs> rules in general, just across the board, <laughs> but... I, and I know that, I asked that on purpose. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not I'm not a big rule guy, but uh, in general, I like to have a wide guitar sound. Guitar sound, um, so I will 
typically try to do doubles with different amps and or different guitars. Okay. Um, or different pedals. It's just, you know... It, it doesn't really, matter. Something that's different that's going to give you that width. Yeah, and that's not... That's not every record and that's not every song because sometimes having the exact same sound doubled can sound really cool and it can and it can like tighten up around other elements that are in the song. Maybe you have mm -hmm. a really dense like, you know, produced arrangement that's like at the beginning of the song. You need sure. a really tight, like really specific thing. So you might like hyper edit and hyper like, you know, homogenize the guitar doubles just to sure. keep it that way. But for like this type of song yeah i wanted i want there to be some width so i am using you know the midtown and the 800 on one side driven by uh overdriven by a tube screamer and then i'm using the flying v and the orange and i was actually using the paisley drive so not there it's not wildly different yeah you know it's not like we're not talking about like you know the dog kennel and uh the target <laughs> right, right you know like yeah. this is this is really like the same type of sound with the same type of overdrive and two guitars that have the exact same pickups in it right right so very nuanced differences between yeah. The two. yeah but even as we go through you'll hear like the 800 sounds like 800 it has kind of that fizzy top and yeah. it has like a pretty naturally scooped sound and yeah. then the orange so is more mid-rangey so let's do that. I'm gonna just solo the uh, the 800 here and play a section. We'll hear that. Yeah, that's really cool. I know the amps really well, so I could identify immediately like, oh, this one is for sure the 800, and this one is for sure the, the orange. Number two, you're gonna start with the simplest sections of the song first. You're gonna go and record all of that stuff before you start tinkering with the experimental sounds. You wanna get all the main stuff done, all the main, if there's a left and right rhythm, in the song, you're gonna track that stuff first before you start experimenting with the wacky, weird sounds. This idea is kind of all about efficiency, and I like to take, a, you know, I really do like to take a lot of time getting the guitars right. So, in order to be really efficient in how we do it, I will propose to the band that we kind of, you know, record the stuff out of order. So, for a song like this, there's a there's rhythm guitar that's all going to be one guitar through the 800 mm -hmm. and that's the sound of it. So I want to knock out all of the parts that have that sound. Gotcha. Um, and there'll be little gaps, like there's gaps in the verses where there's guitar parts, but you know, it's not going to be that specific sound. Yeah. So I just want to get all that done. So we'll spend, you know, 10 minutes just like dialing in the, the amp and the guitar and sort of, I'll listen to the player play through some parts, determine what the right amp is, and just feel like okay, we've got we've got a really good starting point. Then yeah. we'll track all the all the stuff we need to track for that setup. Okay. And then after that's done, I might want to do some tweaks. And with with the way that we set up, sort of simultaneous reamping, mm -hmm. where we're always recording the DI and the amp in series, like the entire time yeah so i might go oh okay we've got all these performances but this this one part i love the way you played it but it's like just a little bit behind the beat so i might go and do that edit and then do all the crossfades and everything i need to do and send everything back through the amp and mm -hmm. i might make a tweak on the amp maybe during that half hour that we're tracking the part i go yeah it seems like maybe there is a little too much presence on this on this sound or maybe there's too much mid-range or maybe there's not enough mid-range or whatever whatever it might be or maybe that's not the right overdrive pedal gotcha who knows yeah i might be making that decision having my producer hat on the whole time and then at the end i'll go all right time to reamp it gotcha and we'll get something and then the goal is for myself and the band to go yeah that's that sounds awesome and if that's what goes to mix we're super happy Gotcha. So that's always the goal. Like I want, I want to be able to sit down at the end of the day, 
listen through the song and go like, yeah, man, this is, this is so close to the finished product. So I think the takeaway then is that you're not saying just dial up any old sound and just get through it because you can always come back to it later. You want to spend some time to try to get the sound that is hopefully going to be the sound that you'll use mm -hmm. and then get as much of those guitars done that have that first simple to get, maybe, you know, basic to get kind of sound, get all that done, get it out of the way, and then kind of build into the spots where you're going to tinker. And for, you know, anybody that is kind of saying, well, what are they tinkering with? Well, like, just as an example, last night when we were going through and working on this song some, you spent, I mean, I think we spent two hours with that one little bass riff idea in both verses and trying to find sounds that were super unique to make it just kind of sound kind of out there mm -hmm. and spacey. And um, it was a lot of fun, you know, kind of, and that's, that's the thing that I think that you are super good at doing as a producer is sitting sure. and kind of, you know, tinkering with, with uh, those kind of ideas and spending a lot of time just deep diving and what if we tried this or what if we tried that? I mean, we spent probably 40 minutes just on all the settings of that one Earthquaker pedal. Number three, this one I think should be pretty obvious, but it's not. And Nate is going to expound upon it and kind of open us up to this. You want to nail the guitar takes. So let's hear what he has to say about that. Best case scenario, we do the performances and everything sounds great and we just move on. Sure. Right? Um, but the performances is really the, the point where I want to spend a lot of time. Like the first two steps are kind of like mental, right? Gotcha. Like, I, you know, having a plan for, for what the song sounds like and what neat, what it needs leads into, okay, what, you know, like, should we use the guitarist gear? Should we use my gear? Whatever. Once we're happy with that, then I want the bulk of the time, like nailing the guitar takes. Yeah. That's really the what makes or break the the guitar sound for a record mm -hmm. for to me you know i i'm we could mess with the amp all day but if the take isn't good then what does it matter like yeah you know I, true. I have to go and f and fix it and edit it for hours and spend all this time like i don't want to do that i want to like i want to hear it back coming out of the speakers and go like yes and like the tiny minuscule amp move makes a difference, but it doesn't make nearly as much of a difference as, you know, nailing the part to begin with. Number four, that's two plus two. Just, uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm trying to make these transitions as fun as possible. Don't, uh, don't hate me for my attempts. So anyways, you're going to reamp what you've recorded or dial in what you think is going to be the final sound. I think part of Nate's mentality with not tinkering around early on is you know there's going to be a left and right rhythm. You've gone through and you've figured out, you've made your plan for what you need. You've grabbed your Les Paul, you've grabbed your Marshall, you know it's a basic rock sound, record the parts. But maybe as you started to go through and get all the parts done, you're realizing, ah, I want it to sound a little more this way. I want a little more mid-range. I want a little less mid-range. Reamp those sounds and finish that stuff before you go on to step number five. I simply have this on my, you know, steps because I want to get to the performances as quickly as possible. Okay. And I want to nail those. And then I, if while we're, while we're going through and getting the performance, if I feel like something's a little off, instead of stopping the momentum of the performance, I'll probably just keep going. Okay. And, and you know, that's not always going to happen. So how do you know? I mean, you got to use your ears a little bit. Yeah. Right? You have to like, um, determine like if there's a problem with the guitar sound, maybe, like I said, maybe you hear something consistently, maybe, maybe the overdrive is like causing the amp to be a little bit fizzier than you want it to yeah. or whatever. So, but I, I don't like to jump into the musician's process too much and like stop them and go, gotcha. you know, not that I won't. Of course, I, I've done it all. I do it all the time. But it's like I try not to. Right. I, I, I don't want to interrupt the process of getting great takes. I got After it. that's done, the and, and I, you know, listen back and maybe do a couple edits. And I'll turn to the guitarist and be like, all right, man, we got it. <laughs> and they can go, oh, good get my Game Boy back, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, and, and then, and then I can take 15 minutes and, you know, even if it's like literally making a new playlist, trying a tweak, going back to the original take we had and going, no, this was better. Yeah. Even if that's it, it's worth the 15 minutes to me 
to cool. just know, okay, I'm super happy with this guitar sound. Cool. So let's um, let's actually do that. What you just talked about okay. doing. All right, cool. now let's go ahead let's and make, make a new playlist, playlist here. Um. Okay, so here's the first take. This is the 800. Uh, it's going to be in the red, and in the blue we've got the the basement. So let's listen to the 800 first. All right, so now let's uh, do that little switcheroo guy in context of the song, and um, I am going to mute the bass, though, so we can focus in on just the guitars and how they sound against the drums. All right, and now we'll do it with the bass. Same, same little test. That's cool. I think both of those are really, really rad sounding tones. Um, yeah. I think I would probably would pick the 800. I like that it's a little bit. Uh... You are correct. <laughs> I, I won. You picked the right choice. I picked the right one. Yeah. Why would you? Why, so just tell us, as a, in, in the producer mind, why would you go with the the 800 over over the basement? Because the basement could be cool for for yeah. for for this song too. Yeah. So let's say this was. The first time I heard the the guitarist, you know, in the control room playing the riff. Okay. And I did those two amps. You know, I, pr I probably wouldn't do these two amps compared because they're very different. But let's say I did. Okay. Um, I'm pretty much always going to try to pinpoint what I like about both amps. Unless there's just nothing I like about it. I love the basement. I think it's one of my favorite amps to record. Yeah. I made a bunch of records with it. It's super snarly and mid-rangey, mm -hmm. which is awesome. I'm addicted i'm a junkie for mid-range i love it i just, like yeah. ask, ask goldman about the him having to come in and be like man this is too much mid-range <laughs> it's just like i really like it i love you know like i love 70s rock that has the super squawky mid-rangey rhythm guitars for the whole records i think it's so great okay it doesn't really work amazingly in a super modern rock mix okay you know so some of those decisions are being made just from experience like i said i kind of like the way the basement sounds better on its own yeah uh but i know even when we listen back with the bass i was like oh yeah with the, the 800 sounds much better mm -hmm. like it's much it's getting out of the way but it's still really present and aggressive so yeah. you know it's a win-win We're on step number five, and I'm uh, I'm holding five pedals. Got a synthwah. Got a color sound guy. I got a flanger. Uh, what else do I have? This is just honestly, this has almost nothing to do with the video. Got that fathom guy, and check out my big muff. Anyways, it's okay. You're not going to be mad at me because this is the funnest part of tracking guitars. And the reason that I was holding five pedals is because now it's time to enter the toy box. This is where you've got all the basic stuff done and you get to start inventing the sounds. Rock music can be weird and wacky. So Nate is really good 
and weird and wacky. He's really good at actually just producing rock songs in general. It, it, stop listening to me, listen to what Nate has to say. I, I mentioned this earlier, but I want to get a lot of the bulk of the rhythm stuff out of the way because the most fun is like taking, you know, there might be one little lead line and you want to take that and you really want to like make it something special. Yeah. And you want to like give it a reason to exist on the song. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, all the other steps apply. What's right for the song? What, you know, what's the, like, do I have the right gear? Do I have the right equipment? Does the band have the right equipment? Yeah. Um, you know, we still need to capture a great take. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's more important to sort of involve the musician with this process. Like, I might be tinkering with the amps and getting, like, like turning the treble knob, you know, and they can, what they can do whatever. You yeah. know, some someone in the band might be interested, but it's not the drummer. You know what I mean? So, like, but when you're doing the other stuff and you're hearing it, there's such a visceral feeling of like, oh, this is what's going to be our song or yeah. our record. Yeah. So I want to involve the band more. Like, what do you guys think of this? What do you think of this? You know, and, and there's there needs to be a little bit of a dialogue because I might be doing something really weird and they're like, we don't like this. And I'm yeah. just like, let me finish it, and then you can decide if you don't like it. You yeah, know exactly. I mean? So, because I might have a crazy idea, and it takes me 25 minutes to even attempt to get there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but yeah, we'll we'll go into it more, like kind of what my process is. Uh, I all yeah, like you said, I always come to the studio with like at least a dozen pedals from my stupid pedal collection at home. Yeah. Um, and that's once again that's step one. Listen to the material that the band has provided for me. Oh, what pedals should I use for this? What kind of music is it? What what kind of band? Do these band does this band have musicians that like pedals? Are they bringing their own pedals? Yeah. So, it's yeah, it's all kind of involved in you're chasing that sort mm -hmm. of little dream of what does this record actually sound like in the end? Yeah. Exactly. You know what I mean? And that's like that's to me that's the fun part. You like allowing your imagination to run away with itself and then you're kind of chasing it and that yeah. that could be a long process like you said last night we were super stoked on the sound of the little pv amp for the bass and we were just trying stuff like what does this pedal sound like what is this pedal? you know it's just like yeah hours of that yeah and i want to do that with a band but i don't want to feel like we we blew a whole day doing that sure so that's why the that third step i talked about where you're just getting performances mm -hmm. you know what i mean there's a fine line i don't ever want the band to feel like they're playing to a sound that doesn't relate to their song. You know yeah. what I mean? Because I've I've had bands come to me and say, oh, dude, we recorded with this guy, and he just DI'd the whole... We tracked for three whole days, and he DI'd everything, and we just had an amp sim running, and then on the last day, we reamped everything. I don't, I, that's not the feeling I want to give a band. Yeah, I want the band to be totally into it. So it's like, there's a line there, and I don't know how to perfectly define it but it's like dude read off the band read off the artist yeah like are they digging it are they just like yeah we love this it sounds great yeah. even if you know you got to make a couple tweaks mm -hmm. you know but i want to i want to get to the end of the day and have a bunch of time you know or maybe it's the end of the song maybe you're doing a couple songs a day and then but at the end you want to have that time to be able to go like okay do we need do we want to ride the time knob on a on a delay pedal just right and just eh, ramp it up right at the right as the chorus kicks in you know like what do you want to do to just yeah. like excite the song you know make it come alive so that's what entering the toy box is all about <laughs> fantastic yeah. well i i really like this i like these five steps um i hope that this is helpful to anybody that is watching this video and trying to figure out like what their process can look like and you know certainly this is what Nate does but it doesn't necessarily have to be what you can do play around with this and I would I would say experiment with it and see you know if this makes sense for the records that you're trying to work on and if you've got questions about this process then I would say you know put them down below and uh, we could be watching that and Nate can get involved and answer some of those and who knows you might get lucky Tyler Nate's brother might answer a few and his answers are great so <laughs>